We are ready to resume our second session of the day. Our first talk is by Karen Koch, who is a PhD candidate and lecturer in Wissenschaftliche Mitarbeiterin at the Freie Universität of Berlin. And her thesis is on teleology in Kant and Hegel's theoretical philosophy. Karen, please. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. And uh, thanks uh, to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk and for making this workshop possible. I'm really pleased to be able to present here in this context and also that we find an in person. So in my talk, I suggest the reading of Hegel's account of finite cognition, which holds that Hegel has a positive account of finite cognition as it is presented in the idea of cognition in the science of logic. In doing, doing so, the following three moments motivate me to read the part on the idea of cognition in this way. First, I want to offer a plausible reading of this passage within the general argumentative strategy and structure of the logic. Second, I think I can show that common readings of this section are results of a misunderstanding about the goal of Hegel's argumentation in the idea of cognition. And third, the reading I propose is also systematically interesting since I propose a positive, con positive conception of finite cognition. That means that contrary to what one might think, Hegel has an account of finite cognition that is, that is not something we need somehow to overcome in order to think speculative. In the idea of cognition, Hegel deals with a conception of cognition that he calls finite cognition. This cognition is finite in so far as the cognizing subject faces an objective world which Hegel explicitly calls the restriction of the subject. Unlike what one might think of a divine omniscient mind, finite cognition must transform the objective world into its own, piece by piece. That means it must grasp, grasp this objective world conceptually in order to cognize it, or as Hegel puts it, it must transform it into conceptual determinations. Hence, finite cognition is essentially discursive. It is common to refer to the account of finite cognition as presented in the idea of cognition as a conception by which Hegel distinguishes a foremost Kantian account of cognition from his own account of cognition that he later develops in the passage on the absolute idea. The Kantian account is supposed to be an investigation into the epistemic limits of human understanding and therefore it is taken to be an epistemic endeavor. Hegel's own account in the absolute idea shall somehow overcome such a finite account of cognition. Thus, the passage on the idea of cognition is read as a critique of a certain, especially Kantian conception of the subject-object relation, and therefore it is read to be a critique of the way of conceptualizing the subject-object difference that comes with such a Kantian account. Orkio Sambrana, for example, understands the account of finite cognition in the idea of cognition in exactly that way. In my talk, however, I will argue that such a purely critical reading does not meet Hegel's argumentative goal. In my view, Hegel is not concerned in the idea of cognition with a critique of epistemic positions, but rather with presenting the fundamental structure that constitutes finite cognition itself. In this sense, I read the idea of cognition as spelling out Hegel's own conception of what finite cognition actually is. And as I will argue, this cognition is not finite because of epistemic limits, but because of the subject matter, the Gegenstand, with which finite cognition is concerned. My talk is structured in the following way. In the first part, I will shortly present the starting point of the idea of cognition. In the second part, I will engage in a discussion of a purely critical reading of the idea of cognition. In order to do that, I will draw on Sambrana's reading of this passage. For, for the sake of brevity, I will limit myself to a discussion of the theoretical idea, the idea of truth. In the third part, I will discuss the relation of the idea of cognition to the idea of life in order to be able to locate the starting point of the idea of, of cognition more precisely because I think that is needed in order to show in which way um, purely critical readings like some Brahmas are wrong. And finally, in the last part of my talk, 
I will provide an example that makes my own reading of the idea of cognition more concrete and more plausible, at least I hope it does. I turn to the first part of my talk. Hegel gives the following introducing characterization of the idea of cognition, and that is the first quote on the handout. It, the idea of cognition, is the purpose that ought to realize itself, or the absolute idea itself still in its appearance. What the idea seeks is the truth, this identity of the concept itself and reality. But at first, it only seeks it. For it is here, as it is at first, still something subjective. End of quote. I read this quotation as follows. An active, cognizing subject pursues the purpose of appropriating reality in a conceptual way. The objective world is that which is opposed to the subject in so far as it is that which the subject is not, a given subject matter, and the given and being shared. The purpose of the subject is the theoretical appropriation of this objective world. The subject mediates between itself and the objective world on a theoretical level. That means in cognition, the subject, as Hegel puts it, transforms the given subject matter of the objective world into conceptual determinations in order to cognize what is actually there. In theoretical cognition, this transforming takes place as follows. The subject transforms the object into a concept in observing and examining the object, objective world. The objective world provides the content of the cognition that is to be gained. Hegel, in fact, describes the subject as equipped with concepts with which it approaches the objective world and by means of which it classifies the objective world but as Hegel points out, these concepts provide only the form of cognition, not the content of it. The content of cognition is gained from the objective world through scientific observations and investigations. Note that this conception of theoretical cognition of the objective world is not to be understood in such a way that the subject simply passively receives the contents of the objective world. Already the terminology used by Hegel transforming points to a different idea of this process. The subject rather takes up this content only in so far as it takes that from the content which is general in it. The background here is Hegel's thesis that what essentially constitutes things are concepts and that concepts do have a more general level of generality than for example, sense impressions. Sensations and sensory impressions are the starting point of the process of cognition but in order to recognize what the contents of these impressions really are, the subject has to think about the content of the impressions that it got. The appearance of a lightning in the sky, for example, does not yet tell us much about what a lightning actually is. If we want to know what really constitutes this phenomenon, we need to think about this phenomenon and investigate into its causes. The result of our reflection, however, is no longer simply a sense impression, but a content which we have brought into a conceptual structure that we can then apply to more sensual impressions of lightness. To transform the content of the objective world into conceptual determinations means in this sense to recognize what is general about the objective content. Now, in the passage on theoretical cognition, Hegel is concerned with the investigation of the relations of the conceptual determinations that are methodically employed in theoretical cognition of the objective world, and that therefore play a structural role in this kind of cognition. According to Hegel, the analytic and synthetic method for gaining knowledge, as it, as it is used in philosophy, for example, instantiates such a structural role. Okay, so far so good. Um, I now turn to Sambrana's reading of this passage to the second part of my talk. At first sight, one might, be, one might be naturally inclined to read these remarks as a repetition of epistemic positions and above all of Kantian positions. Along these lines, Sambrana presents a point of view that is taken in the idea of theoretical cognition as one in which the subject approaches the objective world with empty conceptual definitions or concepts that are themselves independent of the objective world. Sambrana identifies the standpoint taken in theoretical cognition with that of Kantian philosophy. 
According to Kant, we are only able to cognize appearances, but never things in themselves. That what Kant calls an object is always the result of a given representation of an X through our sensibility and of our applying of the categories to this given representation. This way, however, we look at the given subject matter in a modified form or, metaphorically speaking, through our own glasses. We cannot grasp the given subject matter as it is in itself. We can never gain knowledge about the subject matter as it is. We can never gain knowledge about the thing in itself and this conception of finite cognition. Since according to Kant, this is due to our epistemic peculiarity, this opposition of subject and object denotes an epistemic limit. Now, according to Sombrana, in the idea of cognition, Hegel raises the same objection against Kant's conception of cognition that he had already raised against Kant in Glauben und Wissen. In last consequence, Kant's theory of cognition turns out to be contradictory since something is postulated as true knowledge that cannot be true knowledge. And I understand this as follows. According to Kant's theory, we cannot know the thing in itself, but only the appearances <coughs> obtained through our glasses. Kant's conception of knowledge, however, postulates the knowledge of what really is. According to Hegel's interpretation of Kant, however, the thing in itself must be identified as that which really is. But if what really is is ultimately the thing in itself, then knowledge gained about appearances is, according to Hegel, ultimately untrue knowledge. A knowledge of what really is, is denied to us. And Hegel writes in the introduction to the idea of cognition indeed, and this is the second quote, it is immediately clear from this definition of finite cognition, and I think that's the Kantian one he means, that it is a contradiction that sublates itself. It is a contradiction of truth that is supposed at the same time not to be truth, of a cognition of what is that at the same time does not know the thing in itself. In the collapse of this contradiction, its content, subjective cognition, and the thing in itself collapses, that is, proves itself to be an untruth. End of quote. Since Samana identifies the conception of cognition formulated in the idea of cognition with the Kantian account of cognition, she interprets the entire account of finite cognition in the idea of cognition as burdened, as burdened with this charge. Now, I do think there is some plausibility to this reading of the idea of cognition. Kant is clearly a target of Hegel's polemical critique in the sections of the idea of truth. However, I doubt that the idea of cognition is the place where, Kant some, where Hegel somehow revisits the Kantian account of finite cognition, only to criticize it once again. And here's why. First, Samrana's epistemic reading of the idea of cognition might leave for readers a little bit perplexed about the general project of the logic. For in the science of logic, Hegel is generally more concerned with the representation of logical ontological structures of reality than with criticizing epistemic position. A systematic and immanent critique of certain conceptions of knowledge seems rather to belong to the phenomenology of spirit. And there, in the phenomenology, we find Hegel's critique of Kantian or dualistic conceptions of knowledge. Second, from an architectonical point of view, we might object that such a purely critical and negative reading of the idea of cognition is not at par with the, the, Hegel, the Hegel administrative strategy. For according to Hegel, the idea in general is supposed to represent a subject-object unity. And the previous idea to the idea of cognition, the idea of life, represents already a specific form of subject-object unity as it is expressed in Hegel's account of inner purposiveness. Zambrana's reading would therefore undermine the subject-object unity already achieved with the idea of life in favor of a new subject-object separation. Finally, this reading of finite cognition contradicts Hegel's own wording. For Hegel stresses that the idea of cognition is based on the account of the subject-object unity that is already achieved in the idea of life. He writes, and that's the uh, third quote, the two extremes subject and objective world, are identical in that they are the idea. Their unity is first that of concept, a unity which in the one extreme is only for itself and in the other only in itself. 
Second, it is reality, abstract, in the one extreme, and in the other, in its concrete externality. Against this background, I think it is difficult to see how the idea of cognition could actually be solely an interpretation and critique of a dualistic Kantian position on cognition. Nevertheless, I agree with Sambrana that in the idea of cognition, Hegel deals with the structure of finite cognition. However, we can now exclude two reasons for the finitude of this cognition. Finite cognition is not finite because of limits due to, them, to an epistemic nature. Epistemic issues are simply not the primary topic in the science of logic. Furthermore, a dualistic conception of subject and object cannot be the reason for the finitude of cognition in the idea of cognition. For as indicated, the unity of subject and object is already achieved with the idea of life. This brings me to the following thesis. Cognition is finite not because of any, any epistemic limits or because of a dualistic account of subject and object. I rather think that according to Hegel, it is finite because of the subject matter with which finite cognition has to deal. For a justification of this thesis, it is useful to turn to the subject matter of the idea of cognition within the logic. And this is what I do now in the third part of my talk. I think an investigation into the relationship between the idea of life and the idea of cognition is helpful in order to clarify in which way the account of finite cognition in the idea of cognition already implies a fundamental subject-object unity. In the opening passage to the idea of life, Hegel points out the relationship between these two ideas. There he claims that the idea of life is a presupposition of the idea of cognition. And that's the fourth quote. This presupposition of the idea of cognition is now the immediate idea. For while cognition is the concept, and so far as the latter exists for itself, but a subjectivity referring to an objectivity, then the concept refers to the idea as presupposed or as immediate. But the immediate idea is life. Okay, so what are we to make of this? Well, one way to argue would be this. Hegel points out that cognition is a relational concept. Cognition as a subjective activity must refer to a subject matter that shall be cognized. And according to Hegel, that subject matter is the idea of life. However, I think this claim cannot be understood in such a way that Hegel takes over the Kantian assumption according to which concepts are totally empty without reference to appearances. And that is why there has to be a subject matter in order to cognize. For according to such an understanding of the relationship between these two ideas, it would still be up for debate whether the logical principles laid out in the idea of cognition correspond to anything at all. Such an approach, however, is entirely misguided according to Hegel. The logic already begins with the assumption that the determinations of thought are also the determinations of being. It does not even allow for a debate in this sense. I think the following reading is more plausible. The idea of cognition is indeed the idea that ex explicates the separation of subject and object, but only on the basis of an existing unity between subject and object, which is already evident in the idea of life. The idea of life then forms the presupposition of the idea of cognition, because the structure of subjectivity achieved with the idea of cognition would not come about at all without the idea of life. Along these lines, the end and passage of the idea of life goes as follows, and that's the fifth quote. The idea, implicit as genus, becomes explicit in that it has sublated its particularity that constituted the living species and has thereby given itself a reality which is itself simple universality. Thus, the idea that relates itself to itself as idea, the universal that has universality for its determinateness and existence. This is the idea of cognition. End of quote. According to this, the subjective structures expressed in, expressed in cognition are not independent of life. Rather, Hegel points out that life and cognition share the same logical form. And there is some illuminating work done by um, Thomas Kurana and Karen Eng to clarify what that really means. Um, I won't go into this due to time restrictions. Um, and for my argument um, here, it is only important to draw the broader picture. 
Life and cognition share the same logical form. However, unlike life, this logical form relates to itself in cognition. It is brought into self-reflective conceptual structures by thinking subjects. Hegel calls the idea, which has itself as, as its object, i.e. which relates to itself as idea, also spirit or self-consciousness. The idea of cognition thus anticipates structures of the philosophy of spirit. In the following, my intention is neither to focus on the idea of life nor on Hegel's philosophy of subjective spirit, but to emphasize a thought that Thomas Kurana already made fruitful for the constitution of spirit in Hegel's philosophy of subjective spirit. Now, admittedly, the constitution of spirit is per se also not the starting point of the idea of cognition. The idea of cognition is not as, um, about a theory of the genesis of spirit from nature. Nevertheless, I do think we need to take a look at how, um, at how spirit is constituted in order to gain adequate access to the idea of cognition. For it is precisely at this point that Hegel's thesis of the idea of life as a presupposition of the idea of cognition becomes important. Drawing on Kurana's reading, spirit consists constitutively in differentiating itself from the immediacy of the objective world. Or, as one, or as one can also put it, spirit is the act of distinguishing itself from the objective world. Spirit consists essentially in determining the relation between objectivity, the idea of life, and subjectivity itself. The difference between the objective world and spirit is itself one that must be made, or in Hegel's terminology, posited by spirit. The difference between stone and me cannot be determined by the stone, but only by conceptually activity, which is spirit, or in this case, myself. Even more, for the existence of spirit is its distinction from life, it's constitutive. Spirit can become spirit only in its, in its dis dis distinction from life. Oh. Thus, spirit consists essentially in referring to its contents, which are other than spirit. It consists essentially in referring to, for example, to contents of its sensations or perceptions or thoughts, and thus to, to gain self-certainty as a subject that feels or thinks. Thinking of these contents as its own contents is what makes spirit to spirit. So in contrast to an understanding of spirit and thus also of cognition, according to which both are understood as something essentially different from life, we have to understand spirit and thus also the subjective structures in the idea of cognition already in such a way that they neither realize themselves in independence of the objective world or life, nor generate themselves in independence of life or the objective world. The anticipation of the structure of spirit about which the idea of cognition is concerned is therefore also not to be understood as completely independent of the objective world, because this objective world is one which has produced, besides mechanical and chemical structures, also the structure of life. The structure of cognition is in turn only constituted by life. I come to the last part of my talk. From the point of view of the idea of cognition, we are now at a stage of development of spirit in which spirit mediates between itself and the given objective world by determining this world conceptually through cognition. Spirit conceptualizes sensual impressions and thereby makes explicit the subject-object unity that already exists in itself or implicitly in the idea of life. Hegel puts it this way, and that's the next quote. This unity of concept and objective world is now posited through cognition, end of quote. It is through cognition that is through the conceptual grasp of objects that we learn about what essentially constitutes objects, namely that they are on conceptual determinations. Okay, now I still owe you an answer to the following question. Why and in which sense is, cognition is the kind of cognition taking place here finite? Here's my suggestion. As I have explained in the first part of my talk, the idea of cognition lays out the cognit cognitive methods of gaining cognitions, of gaining cognitions of the objective world. In so far as these cognitions are cognitions about the objective world, however, cognition is always also about determining the relation of itself to the other of itself. And it is this general relatedness of the subject to the objective world that, according to Hegel, constitutes the finitude of this conception of cognition. 
and that's the uh, code seven. The relation between the two ideas, which are identical in themselves or as life, is therefore a relative one. This is what constitutes the determination of finitude in this sphere. We have here the relationship of, of reflection because the distinguishing of the idea within itself is just the first judgment, because the presupposing is not yet a positing, and because, for that very reason, the objective idea is for the subjective idea the immediate world that is found to be already there, or the idea of life is here in the appearance of singular existence. End of quote. I think Hegel stresses two points here. First, the finitude of finite cognition is due to the relatedness of cognition to its subject matter, life. Second, the subject matter of cognition is itself of such a, such a structure that it contains limited, single, and then so far finite things. I would like to explicate this briefly by drawing on an example that Hegel gives himself. In the idea of cognition, Hegel presents, besides the principles of definition and the theorem, the principle of division as a method for cognizing the objective world. Thus, for the cognition of physical nature, we divide nature into species and genera. Now, it is likely that we will discover new species which won't fit into the previous divisions drawn by us. Here we must either change, that means extend the previous genus ascription and justify in what way the now extended number of species can be designated as species of the one genus, or we would have to explain in what way the new species does not belong to the very genus to which we originally wanted to assign it. This way of carrying on without the concept, and that's also Hegel quote, is according to Hegel, however, not an expression of the limits of our epistemic capacity. Rather, it is the case that, and that's the um, last quote, it is physical nature itself that presents such a contingency in the principles of division. Because of the external dependency of its actuality, it stands in a manifold of connectedness, which for it is likewise given. There is therefore an assortment of principles to which it has adapted itself. Following one principle in one series of its forms, but another in another series, while also producing hybrids that go in different directions at once. Thus, it happens that in one series of natural things, certain marks come to the fore as especially significant and essential that in another series become inconspicuous and purposeless. The result being that it is impossible to abide by any such principle of division. End of quote. Thus, classifications of nature will always remain in a way inaccurate and therefore fallible, but this is not due to epistemic limits. It is due to the subject matter with which the subject deals in its conceptual determining activity. Now to conclude, the fact that finite cognition has objective given presuppositions is not to be understood primarily as a critique of finite cognition, but as, but as what constitutes finite cognition in the first place. Thus, rather than rejecting the standpoint of finite cognition, as the common reading suggests, I argued that Hegel believes that we must think finite cognition adequately in the first place. Thanks for your attention. Our next call is from Philip Niklas. Philip is a final year PhD candidate at the University of Warwick, and his thesis concerns Hegel's critique of determinism and contemporary accounts of freedom. His talk today is entitled Hegel's Teleology, Function or Intention. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Uh, those near and far. Okay, so today I'll, uh, I'll try to give a sketch of uh, Hegel's account of theology primarily drawn from his section as it is found in the science of logic. And the question I want to consider is whether theology is best understood as a function or intention. And, and what sort of prompted this question is uh, mainly Terry Pinkert's commentary on it. And so I will, towards the end of the talk, I'll, I'll, go, uh, I'll, go, I'll go to that and reflect a bit and then draw my conclusions. So uh, before I proceed, uh, maybe I should make clear what I mean by function and intention, since one may confuse the two or use them synonymously. Very briefly, function I take to be a factor related to or dependent on other factors. 
for example, the price is a function of supply and demand, or something is functioning as something for something else. For example, the hardness of steel in its function as plow. Intention I see as a mental state or a kind of representation, a system um, takes has before itself that uh, represent an explicit commitment to carrying out a certain action or actions in the future. For example, I plan on having a drink or two after today's sessions. Now, does teleology uh, uh, fall within the former or the latter or perhaps both? Let us see. Uh, so, what I'm how I'm going to do it, it is uh, I'll go kind of close to the text and try to unpack it. Um, so, the advantage of this, I hope, is that we get a bit more details. But the disadvantage is that I won't get, get a, give a comprehensive account of theology itself. So, um, but hopefully, we can develop that in the Q in the Q and A afterwards. So objectivity in Hegel's logic goes through various stages of mechanical organization through the more intimate chemical relations to then unfold as teleology. Here the concept or self-determination comes back into view because it is now understood that objects exhibit a driven intelligent or rational organization. Um, this is the developed, developed objective concept of purpose. So I say developed because I think there is an objective concept already at the level of law. So there is something added to purpose, I think, that is not there in law. Typically, when purposes, goals, or ends are evoked, there is already something very defined toward, towards which something moves. In this sense, we speak of external purpose. But Hegel's teleology does not begin with external purpose, since that presupposes means, and at the outset, we have only purpose. We have only the sense of self-determination. Now, externality is certainly involved, but it's the general externality which pertains to objects, which is at stake here. So Tommaso Perini notes that purpose at first stands opposed to objectivity and to independence. The minimal definition of purpose involves this externality, but only as a moment of purpose itself, such that the opposition per se is not between two objects, but more as between two logics. This sense of purpose is immediately deficient. It is self-determination that is seen as external to objectivity, even though it emerges from it. Purpose thus presupposes the world of mechanical and chemical, and then becomes the impulse of purpose to overcome this presupposition. So purpose remains abstract, we could say, as long as it is wholly apart from the mechanical and chemical. Hegel discusses at several points the attribution of intelligence to purpose. In its superficial sense, the purposeful object appear as if it was created by some intelligent, extra mundane author. There is a kernel of truth in this, but as the perception currently stands, it is a bit self-defeating, I think. If a purposeful object really were so determined by some intelligent author, then this turns into a mechanical process whereby the purposeful object has its determinacy simply given to it by another object, in this case, the author and the logic essentially reverts to determinism. So we must not assume another object for intelligence, but see that, quote, purpose is to be taken as the rational in its concrete existence, end of quote. So the object that displays purpose then simply, quote, manifests rationality by being the concrete object, concrete concept that holds objective difference in its absolute unity, end of quote. The really important point from Hegel, I think, is that intelligence as such does not obtain without its actual manifestation. So the superficial view of purpose immediately assumes intelligence in the purposeful object to be otherworldly because, as I see it, it immediately grasps and isolates the rational from its concrete existence. So this is logically possible because purpose at this stage in the logic is, quote, still something subjective. Is activity still directed to an external objectivity, end of quote. The superficial view tacks onto something true, but fixates on this one element of purpose instead of thinking it through its full conception. So we have noted that purpose is burdened with a presupposition. It has the mechanical and the chemical world as moments of itself, but, it, but this makes it so that there is a determinate difference between the two. In this, purpose is made finite. However, 
purpose being the form of the concept and self-determination is infinite. And infinity is not, in Hegel, ultimately set apart from the finite, but pervades it and returns to itself in it. This means that purpose is identical with, to itself in its externality. The overcoming of the presupposition now can be more clearly specified as the overcoming of an immediate world marked by indifference and deposit these as determined by the concept. Willem de Vries considers this determination of the concept as a subjective end, as something intentional by a mind. So while purpose lends itself to that view, I do not think Hegel's account needs to make the appeal to a cognitive thinker for the present logic of purpose. Instead, the concept stands here simply for the rational or that which self-determines. This affords Hegel's account also the ability to posit rational forms in objectivity without directly implying a self-conscious thinker, which may align to, you know, with things like natural evolutions, where one posits an intelligent development in nature without the explicit direction of a mind. But however, you know, this is the question of the paper. So let us carry on. So as purpose currently stands, it is something opposed to mechanical chemical objectivity. And this negative relation to objects is, quote, equally a negative attitude towards itself. But, end of quote. but again, this negative relating forms equally a positive moment since purpose is directed inwards in being directed outwards. As the concept is its form, purpose has the continuity of universality built into it. So what is left for purpose is to sublate the idea that it is merely implicit in indifferent objectivity by making it explicit for itself that it is. Indeed, to posit purpose in indifferent objectivity would seem to cancel that element of wholesale indifference. Since purpose is not indifferent to determinateness as mechanically given, but sensitive to the determinateness since it determines itself. However, it is also not enough to simply insert purpose into the mechanical chemical objectivity since purpose in its current form is burdened by this presupposition. Hegel writes precisely that quote, the determinedness of the moments of the concept is externality. The simplicity of these moments within the unity of the concept is, however, incommensurable with what this unity is, and the concept therefore repels itself from itself." End of quote. The issue is that the mechanical chemical objects are external by definition, yet they are included as moments of purpose. So a second externality obtains internally within purpose where it is not identical with its moments, but only with this difference. Both appear to be unified simply in terms of externality, but this is incommensurate with the unity of the concept as self-determination, so as unity of difference. A conceptual repulsion occurs within purpose itself, whereby it is particularized and rendered a determinate content. This content is only inner for the present moment, but given the presupposition of an indifferent objective world the and the impulse to posit its own activity in it, purpose makes equal its inner content with an indifferent object, turn the latter into, quote, something determined by the concept. So this object determined by the concept is now then the means. Slowly, we begin to reach the typical understanding of purpose as external purpose. But Hegel has so far, so far shown, if he's right, that purpose can be posited without means, which lends itself to a kind of superficial view of uh, excrement in author and so forth. In addition, purpose itself makes the means necessary from itself, right? Perhaps we could say that the first purpose of purpose is to be genuine purpose or real purpose. It is now understood that purpose has posited a mechanical chemical object as determined by the concept or according to some rational organization. This object is the means. It is important to keep in mind that the means remains, quote, an external existence indifferent towards purpose itself and its realization, end of quote. However, the means also receives determination from purpose, in which case it is not something merely indifferent. The means then is a unity of both the subjective purpose and the objective externality, and this forms a syllogism. But as Hegel goes on to inform, inform us, Purpose and externality are only externally linked in the means. Moreover, the syllogism here is formed, the syllogism here formed is a subsumptive one, where indifferent and indeterminate external objectivity inheres in the means, which in turn inheres in the determinacy of purpose. 
purpose is not, direct, not directly connected with objectivity, and indeed its connection to the means is also external. Hegel writes that the means is, quote, a mechanical object that possesses purpose only as a determinateness, not as a simple concretion of totality, end of quote. So we seem to be marred with the idea that purpose stands outside the mechanical object, or chemical object. But as Hegel continues, the means must be the unifying term. Purpose is the imminent reflection of means, such that purpose refers to itself within the means. Now, why does this externality between the means and the purpose obtain, or the externality between the terms of the syllogism? Remember that purpose presupposes an external objective domain, and it has built into its concept to posit itself in this externality. Externality thus has always been a factor of purpose. What the means make clear, however, is that these moments of purpose come apart. The means make explicit that purpose and the mechanical chemical objectivity are external to each other. We could say then that the mean is the judgment of purpose. It's determining of objects as means, but also as the separation of the initially connected moments of purpose. But means, but the, but means and purpose nevertheless maintain some irreducible connection. They are not absolutely external, just as in judgment, subject and predicate are not wholly separated. As Hegel states, quote, universality is the connection of purpose and the means, end of quote, where an indifferent mechanical object that trades one determinedness as well as another, it matters to purpose, however, what determinedness the object has, and in this it has already been posited as means. Indeed, the fact that the mechanical objects uh, quote, non-self-subsistence consists precisely in its being the totality of the concept only implicitly, end of quote. The development of, objecti of objectivity will not be to merely make explicit this implicit concept. I think this has been achieved in its transition from the objective logic into the subjective logic. Now I'm talking about the, the big division, like the two volumes. But to make explicit why explicitness requires some level of implicitness. Furthermore, I think the logic of purpose shows that it cannot act merely by itself, but must do it through another. This, moreover, sheds lights on self-determination in the idea that a fuller sense of self-determination is one that actively relates to and integrates as such other determination or simple determination. The means, therefore, retains an irreducible connection to purpose, and the means is a concrete unity of subjective purpose and objective externality. Now, the element of objective externality indicates that the means has a one side of subsistence different from and against purpose. This further shows that the initial presupposition of purpose still persists, namely that the mechanical chemical world is not posited as determined by purpose. However, through the development of the means, purpose is no longer, uh, quote, no longer mere impulse and striving end of quote, but is the activity to which an object is directed towards an end. As Hegel puts it, quote, in the means, the moment of objectivity is posited in its determinedness as something external, and the simple unity of the concept now has this objectivity as such within it, end of quote. In the means, then, we find that the purpose is at the beginning of its end. In addition to the presupposition of purpose, however, there is not only an indifference on the side of the mechanical chemical object, but also an indifference on the side of purpose itself. The thought here seems to be that if purpose remains external to the means, it can dispense with the means as it likes without any risk to itself. And this, I think, is the cunning of reason. For if one set of means becomes inadequate or damaged, another can be brought in to fulfill the end. But here, purpose's own activity is indifferent to determinedness from others. The deficiency here is that the product of uh, such purpose becomes again a means for which purpose and its activity is external, such that, quote, only a purposeful means would result, not the objectivity of purpose itself, end quote. The point Hegel wants to make, I think, is that purpose in its current form takes for granted its activity, Purpose is merely subjective. But we have learned that purpose is now active in this means, which must lead to a new understanding where purpose cannot determine the mechanic, mechanical object as 
something merely external to it. So I think later in the logic, life will signify a much stronger non-indifference to its constituent needs. Whereas here, I think the, the case is still um, much, much more loose and much more marked by indifference. So we now make it, I, I think, to external purposiveness. So we have understood the object to be a moment of the concept, each retain a sphere of their own, independent of the other. Something is being taken as a goal for some, and something else is taken as a means to achieve that goal. For example, my goal is to till the land and I make use of the plow to achieve this. But tilling the land could be achieved otherwise. I could use my hands, so this would be somewhat laborious, or I could employ the strength of an ox or even better a tractor. The goal is here external to the means since its activity is indifferent to the means. I would have to employ a second criteria, let's say efficiency, to differentiate these terms. But here it could equally be asked whether this purpose is in and for itself good, which seems to be like yet another criterion and so on. And this does not explicate external proposalness, ex external proposalness as much as it repeat, merely repeats it. So let's just stay with the first example then. In external purpose, it looks like the means are conceptually higher than the purpose it serves. As Hegel declaims, quote, the plow is more honorable than are immediately the enjoyments which it produces and which are the purposes. The tool lasts while the immediate enjoyments pass away and are forgotten, end of quote. But as he then goes on to explain, logically, the tool only has the determinedness of tool insofar as it realizes some purpose. It is not that purpose, in this case, like tilled land, stands apart from mechanical process, the plow tilling the land, but manifests itself in the process. The land actually becomes tilled. The process, in turn, depends on the rationality that is implied in the purposeful activity. More precisely, the particular wooden and metal object would lose its determinedness plow if its purpose of tilling land were not implied in it. Even though, logically, the latter purpose as content remains something external and indifferent within the former within the former means as form. It is owing to this externality between purpose as content and the means as form that the latter is interchangeable, which we pointed to already. But this precise externality is not a um, not a difference between objects between the object and the purpose as two diverse objects, but a difference within purpose itself. The fact that it lends itself to multiple diverse means suggests that a simple determinedness or identity is transferred from one intended purpose, from the intended purpose to its realization. Indeed, the teleological process is, quote, the, tra the translation of the concept that concretely exists distinctly as concept into objectivity. This translation is a presupposed other, into a presupposed other is the rejoining of the concept through itself with itself. End of quote. The intended purpose is to till the land, and through the means, this intention is realized. In terms of content or determinedness, we have here an identity from beginning to end. Hence, the theological process or activity has in its end its beginning, or in the effect is the cause. As Hegel writes, quote, it is a becoming of what has become that in it only that which already concretely exists comes into existence, end of quote. This feature of teleology is commonly despised since it appears that one merely ends up with what, 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 what one first assumed or that intention is some kind of uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. As Hegel has shown, there must be an identity that is carried over from intention to realization or function to realization in external purpose since the determinedness meant to be achieved is already deployed ahead of the process. It seems that uh, the common complaint has some validity, but as we shall next explore, external purposiveness cannot be the whole of teleology. In the teleological process so far, we have seen that purpose has in part sublated externality by positing a continuity from intention to realization. But this continuity is broken when the teleological process is realized in the product. For, for the product of external purpose receives its, its determinateness externally, just as if it was an imposition from the outside. So it seems this latter external determination 
revives the mechanical relation, whereby an indifferent determinateness is merely put into one object by another. Perhaps what is commonly despised in teleology is not purposefulness per se, but the resurgence of mechanical relation, relations when they should be done away with. External purpose seems to violate the object, putting something into it that is not there by nature and preventing the object from freely determining itself. It should be noted that this is a problem that emerges for purpose, not for mechanical relations. The latter are, after all, indifferent either way. How then are we to deal with this problem? First, we can distinguish the merely mechanical from the purposeful by understanding that the purposeful object is a moment of unity. Although the product of external purpose has its determinateness given to it from the outside, that determinateness is not as such something merely external. The determin that determinateness forms part of a whole such that it is for itself not of a mechanical character. To continue with the example, tilling is an external imposition upon the land such that once the tele teleological process is re realized and done, the land, the land now has the determinateness tilled, for which the object land remains indifferent to and does not maintain on its own accord. But the determinateness tilled forms a moment of another concept, namely it becomes the means for another purpose, such as mixing amendments into the soil. Still, land or object has a content of its own different to the content of tilling or purpose. Yet it is not that purpose alone can directly be enacted on, this, on its object, but must take another object as its means. The same deficiency, however, applies to the means as to the target object. Namely, that purpose is externally and mechanically applied to the means. In the example, the plow is itself the result of some purpose towards which other means needed to be applied. The point being that the seemingly simple structure of external purposiveness presupposes uh, the result of further operations of external purpose. Hence, as Hegel confirms, quote, the connection in which the tele teleological process consists are not themselves conclusions or mediations, but already uh, presuppose the conclusion for the production of which they are supposed to serve as means, end of quote. External purpose is thus parasitic on or takes for granted other purposes and means. The significance here is that the product of the teleological process and the means both are equally objects determined by an external purpose, and so the product is, quote, the same as what the means is, end of quote. If the product of the teleological process is another means, this presupposes another purpose, such that this product is not the realized purpose. Hegel writes that it is a matter of indifference whether we speak of this as a fulfilled purpose or another means, since the determination is a relative one and not an objective one, that is something that could be self-subsistent and independent. Hence, for external purpose, all objects are means. That is, there is no object that can adequately realize a purpose imposed upon it. Indeed, it is not that this is a deficiency per se, but rather it is the function of objects to be taken up and used by another. Um, and I, as a quote here, anything which is a, intended for the realization of a purpose and is taken essentially as a means is as such a means by virtue of its vocation, which can be used up. They fulfill their vocation, therefore, only through their being used up and worn out, and only by virtue of their negation do they correspond to what they are supposed to be. There's a lot we could, we could do to unpack this, but I will now close my presentation of teleology here. So we have not quite reached objective purpose, but we can already see that external purpose presupposes further external purpose, and that the object that serves a purpose is one that has negated its externality on its own. This is a hint that objects are internally purposive, and that ultimately what is used in objects is their purpose for another purpose. The purpose of purpose is to make itself a means for another, or we could say self-determination turns into determination for another self-determination. Terry Pinkert does not think that Hegel's account of teleology is actually about teleology at all. He distinguishes between a teleological system and a purpose-like system. 
A teleological system is one where a system explicitly acknowledges a certain goal or outcome and then works towards it via means, such that this goal has some causal efficacy. A purpose-like system may attain some goal or outcome, but without actually acknowledging this goal. The system cannot be said to have devised the means to achieve precisely this goal, such that it cannot be said to perform its action because of the goal. Hence, the latter Pinkert claims is not theological in the proper sense. Now, the cunning of reason could be a surrogate for the explicit acknowledgement, but Pinkert thinks that it is, by definition, implicit intelligence, which, where states appear as if they were, were rationally ordered, not that they actually are and therefore does not match genuine teleology. In one sense, Pinkert, I think, is right, but I think he also misses another important point. Hegel's objective account of teleology, teleology, teleology cannot be the cognizant teleology Pinkert seeks, since more advanced elements are at work in, in, um, in that what, than what is offered in the base mechanical and chemical realm. The more cognizant teleology, I think Hegel deals with at the end of his chapter on cognition, particularly on the syllogism, syllogism of action. If Hegel were to offer the cognizant teleology Pinkert wants, the immediate problem is, is how purpose is known in advance. In Pinkert's example, quote, without reliance on some set of causal generalizations, in many instances, Sherman would not be able to act intentionally, since Sherman could then have no idea what he would have to do in order to bring about phi, end of quote. So Pinker take the, takes these causal generalizations to be mechanical in nature, but they are logically purpose-like, to use Pinker's term, since in order to use objects determinately, the contents has to be already realized in some fashion. The hardness of the wood is already realized before it's taken up to be used as planks, which are then used for housing, furniture, and et cetera. There is then necessarily a step between pure mechanical reality and then cognizant teleology. And that is that objects, in as much as they can be used for some function, exhibit purposeful contents. This rational exhibition, Hegel claims, belongs to objectivity rather than cognition. And I think this is meant to diffuse the problem of knowing a purpose before it occurs. As Hegel's account bears out, if we have had more time, an object is purposeful because some purposeful purpose is already realized in it. Cognizant teleology is then relieved of the problem of how its purpose obtains before the system knows it, since purpose obtains at the level of objectivity prior to life and cognition, or we could say cognizant teleology relies on the development of purpose in objectivity. In other words, if I read Hegel right, there must be some functional purpose-like intermediary stage between mechanism and cognizant teleology to provide the contents for the latter to be used as to be used. Moreover, the reason this intermediary stage must belong, must belong to objectivity is because the contents themselves are not imputed on the objects, but belong to them in virtue of their inner determination, their concept, such that objective validity is then granted to the designs of a later cognizing system simply because it comes from the objects themselves. Cognizant systems uh, are then the further developed cunning of reason that exploits the system that purposes are not imputed into objects, but are such exploited. So, you know, examples like farming, livestock, automation, building machines that build other machines, and then using determinacies that are already there. Not surprisingly, then, Pinkert's assessment of Hegel's account of teleology is judged as empirically vacuous. Pinkert does not have the intermediary steps step and asks, after discerning some uh, seeming random process, to have reason, quote, how could one know what the goal was? Either one must extrapolate it from observation of current processes, or it must be revealed to one, most likely through some kind of religious vision, end of quote. As I think Hegel shows, the goal is already partially realized, since without this anchoring, the goal would be completely disconnected and thus could never be determined in principle. That would make it an abstract purpose. The cunning of reason, therefore, is only a hidden directing insofar as it manifests. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for that talk. Uh, okay, so we're now going to go to the Q&A session.
uh, people on the Zoom chat, please uh, raise the uh, your, your hands on the hand function. Okay, uh, So, thank you both for your talk. I have a brief question for, for you. Uh, and I'll start with Kai. So, first of all, thank you for this like positive reading of finite cognition, which I think we share a lot. We agree. I mean, we share the same reading. I think you'll see from my talk later that we start from the same presuppositions. And so I'm just curious about um, your reading, your positive reading of Hegel's finite cognition in the sense of the actual process of taking up objects and turning them into conceptual determinations. Because from some of your formulations, maybe one might infer that you want to say that there's sense impressions are the non-conceptual content that the subject takes up in a way and then re-elaborates. But then at a certain point you were saying that determinations are also objective. Like there's some sort, how do you see um, the relationship there? Like uh, just to clarify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, should I answer directly? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. No, okay. Then, yeah. yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, I think I wasn't like, yeah, I didn't elaborate on that, so, um, and maybe I have to be more precise on this. So, um, the way I want to go is, like, like, I would say starting point would be that there is the logical identity of the new of life and cognition, and then uh, one would, of course, um, have to discuss how to, to flesh it out. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I would go to rather maybe um, a transformative account. So there are like two accounts how um, um, cognition and uh, or like how sense impressions or animal life and cognitive life relate to each other. Mm -hmm. And I would go, may, uh, maybe you're not quite, I mean, I yeah. work on this, but I think I would go to like in direction to a transformative account, which would somehow mean that, um, that in a way also sense impressions are already like sense impressions of cognitive subjects are different from sense impressions of humans and animals because they are somehow already structured conceptually even though the content is not like the concept itself so yeah mm -hmm. i mean that's what i want to work on like in the next project also i would like to turn to Hegel's psychology because I, yeah i think i have to do that in order to have a more precise theory about that even though I, yeah, I don't think it's in the idea of cognition. No, not yeah. directly. Yes, no, right. I agree. Yeah. So that's why, yeah, but the question is really important. So, yeah, but that's yeah, the way I would go. Thanks. And for Philip, uh, thank you also for like this interpretation of teleology as a non necessarily subjective activity that cannot be restricted to the activity of a finite subject. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm, I just want you to go back to the passage on the wearing up and like the self-destruction or like destruction of the objects, like when they sublate themselves and they negate their negativity, so to speak. So, but I'm wondering, isn't your reading open to a sort of infinite regress in the sense that you say that all objects fulfill their purpose in being means for other purposes in the sense you opened up the possibility of defining objectivity in this way in a sense of mm -hmm. and i'm wondering then how do you interpret the translation to the idea like how do you interpret the final passage to the idea maybe i'm not understanding some of your like um points correctly so you maybe can clarify this yeah. for me yeah we will uh, unfortunately i didn't get to the latter half of yeah the exactly where this kind of resolved. But the way it is resolved is to see that contained within external theology or and is already internal theology. Because what I think it was, was trying to show, loosely speaking, is that purposes cannot be imputed into objects. They already adhere within the object. And so in order to realize some purpose, some pur other purpose is already realized with the object. Mm -hmm. And I think this generates the implicit Distance concept in objectivity, which 
think carries through to the OG and doesn't really become surpassed until we enter to that idea. Yeah. Okay. And that's why I think the OG, in its functional sense, belongs to a meeting. Yeah. Something seen in the objects belongs to the objects. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Well, I just wanted to understand your reading better. I think like, we're on the same page. <laughs> yeah, and the, about the objects self negating themselves. I think, Kind of already occurs in mechanism where you think you know, logic mechanism through it will cease being fully mechanistic it'll turn itself into chemistry and then chemistry might be also so we don't say that purpose is electricity in the world mm. but that we can only say after right. and, uh, i think also partially teleology does yeah okay thank you um uh, oh, thank you um, thank you both you guys, just like, uh, for these great talks. Um, I have one for each, like one person for each. Um, firstly, I, I just want to start with Karen, actually. Um, I'm not so familiar with the uh, cognition part of the logic to be honest. So just help me out to understand. So you said that the finite cognition is finite, um, because not because due to the epistemic limits, like we see in Kant, or not because of dualism that we might also find in Kant. Uh, but due to the subject matter, and then you said that subject matter in the, towards the end actually is the objective world, the objective world that the the, the 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 subject or the agent has to cognize in a sense, right? So the very idea of that subject matter actually comes with the package of dualism, right? Because we need to still have a kind of a subjective world that needs to cognize the objective world, or there has to be a kind of a sense of dualism over there. So like um. Although like you wanted to argue that like there is a kind of unity in the very activity of cognizing the objective world, right? Because we are um, cognizing the objective world, not only kind of taking the impressions, but also kind of processing the impressions and making a kind of con conceptual content of it. But still, there seems to be a, some sort of dualism going on there, right? Like yeah. it is not entirely unity. And probably if it would be a unity, then I think it was just absolute idea because like the next chapter comes. Um, uh, the, the absolute idea comes as a kind of next chapter to um to the cognition so um what to think about the um the possible kind of like sneaky feature of dualism actually coming or kind of like persisting in um in cognition in finite cognition. yeah well, thanks for the great question um yeah so yeah well, i want to argue against is that um the whole account of finite cognition is somehow Kantian account because that would presuppose we have some concept a priori, and then we have someone to justify why they attain to the reality to the objective world. And I don't think that that's the inverted picture there. Um, I mean, so what I was arguing against was really saying something like, no, there's nothing going on as a critique of this Kantian account, rather it is its own development of this account, but it doesn't mean that somehow, um, that somehow cognition has to relate to something. So to do an objective word. So um, and Hegel himself he said something like the, um, I don't know if I can remember it like the, the, the proper wording, but he said something that the idea of cognition is the judgment or something like that. So you, of course you have you know, some kind of separation between subject and objective word. Um, and um, the subject has to recognize piece by piece in a way. So I would say that's true, but um, yeah, but what I really wanted to say was, okay, yeah, even if we have this kind of separation, it's grounded in a basic unity. And that's a difference, and I would say that's also the difference to Kant, because Hegel is arguing that without life, we can't have subjective, subjective cognitive structures. And I would say that's like a really different picture, because then he argues some, like something like that, okay, we cognize the kind of reality that um that is somehow also the reason why those own subjective structures are there. Okay. So, is this clear yeah, definitely, definitely. Thank you very much. Thanks. So my question, next question for sure. Um so I mean so the title is basically a question, right? Um Agasology is function of intention. So and I think like you favor the function for sure. Um, uh, but since you mentioned as well, like um, Hegel's understanding of teleology, the purpose as a kind of intelligence, like uh, not the intelligence of the subject, maybe, but like 
not subjects in in the sense of like agents like us human beings and so on so forth, but like kind of a grander um, or grand sense of of, of intelligence I mean, like God and so on and so forth. Since like there is still so I mean, you already said actually that like that intelligence I was talking about in teleology is not the intelligence like our cognitive capacity and so on and so forth, but it's more like kind of like rationality like yeah, rationality as well. exactly. Yeah. Um, but since like the chapter's name is also kind of subjective theology, what gives me the impression that what Hegel is talking about, at least that grand um, intelligence might be a moment, or kind of like let's say the intentional moment, or the um, not the mental as a mental state, but kind of like as a not merely objective, but a kind of like subjective sense of purpose. So in a sense, like if you read, as you suggest actually, theology is a entirely functional or objective theology, we might be missing something about the subjective part that is also kind of like um, at work actually. Okay. So like in a sense, like um, do you are you kind of like welcoming um, any subjective reading of intelligence in Hegel's theology, or your objective reading is basically just diminishes any kind of uh, subjective outcome that we can get from the text? Well, I, I mean subjective here to mean that uh, something has its character in virtue of itself, so <laughs> self determination. I think that's all that subjective at this point means. And I think subjectivity, the third part of the document concept, explores kind of pure self determination mm -hmm. without any reference to how that's properly done in things like objects, mechanics, means, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can think of it as you know, some cognizing or subjective person, an agent to some degree, but we don't have. I think the logic is more general than that at this stage. And that a cognizing thinker can employ theology uh, and you know, does. But what they're doing as cognizant, I think, is and requires another kind of more elaborate logic, such as life and so forth. Yeah. Okay. I'll go later. I need to think about it. Okay. Yeah, because I think I'm still missing something. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll take a very short and sharp question and then a long explanation, um, explanation about cognition. So, short and sharp first. Uh, you began your paper with function or intention. Um, in your usage of the word function, uh, you said it is a fact linked to or dependent on another element. And as I understand it, that's more or less interchangeable with a, something like a set theoretic definition. Uh, Maybe, yeah. yeah, for two sets, X and Y, there's a function from X to Y. If yeah. for each element in X, there is one and only one element in Y matched to it. Okay. Um, you get the X, you get the like Y out. Yeah. And then you had intention. And when you talked about intention, you actually said two different things. You said one, a mental state, comma, or a representation which amounts to a commitment. I might be paraphrasing you. Now, I think you've been very persuasive in arguing that we should not assume that there are mental states implied in external teleology. I, you've, I think you've got to be correct there. I want to ask whether you think there is any room to argue that, say, entities like plows could be spoken of as, in, as being or involving representations that are aptly spoken of as commitments. Can we de-psychologize that concept enough that intention is still a viable option? I'm not sure I follow that aspect about could you could you could certainly you maybe? Hegel definitely allows for at least some non-psychological normative concepts. So um, apodictic judgments, this house so-and-so constituted is good, yeah. is about the house, and it's about the comparison that a specific house has with its what it was to be. So there's at least some normativity that doesn't require psychology. Can we impute, can we say the same of commitments? <clears throat> Good question. 
because I, the, the way I spoke about commitment was, you know, having a plan, an idea, and that you're going to uh, pursue it. And we agree. But that, that it's, by itself yeah. doesn't necessarily mean commitment. I think I might intend to go out uh, fields tomorrow, but you might not follow through. Maybe you need to take some steps towards to actually show your commitment. But then you're realizing parts of it, mm -hmm. right? So that's the converse. You can have uh, psychological states that are just spoken of as intentions that don't amount to commitments. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. Uh, there's that Frank Ramsey quote, uh, uh, to say a man believes in hell means he does those things that would cause him not to be thrown into hell. The verbal locution isn't sufficient for the actual commitment. Yeah, yeah he really believes in hell. You would, you would not do he those things. Yes, he would use everything in his power to avoid. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, well, uh, yeah. It sounds like it's one for us to meditate on. Yes, it is, I think. Yeah, okay. Thank you. It's a, it's a good one. Okay, and now I shall plumb your wisdom. Um, so <laughs> what I would, and it was a very good paper, thank you very much. Um, you've been, I'm definitely persuaded that this chapter isn't reducible to a critique of Kant. I'm definitely persuaded also that Hegel is presenting some kind of theory of cognition. My, in, my queries are about its connection with the preceding chapter with life. Uh, so when we end life, we've got genus and species. And the genus seems to consist of those moments of universality and particularity in life, uh, where the species seems to consist of those moments that have a sort of singular determinateness. Um, which in cognition will be singular determinateness, I think, of the world over against the subject. What I don't understand is how we get from that, those two, out of genus we get a cognizing subject, and out of species we get a world, uh, particularly because you do seem to use the language of recognizably human cognition. And I'm not sure how we go from getting a genus to getting a recognizably human cogn cognizing subject. Could you uh, unveil the mystery for me? Yeah. I'm trying not to say in fresh. <laughs> I asked this and they just said Well, that's what I'd, I'd very much like to know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, first of all, I wouldn't, yeah, I don't know if I used the word human. I mean, for me, it, maybe I did, but if, if not, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't, put, I wouldn't put too much in it because for me, it would be enough to have like finite subjects. Doesn't have to be humans. Sure, sure. We'll allow for uh, very kind of subjects, uh, and yeah, it can be humans or yeah, and now yeah, I guess I just need to reflect it because it's not humans. Shall we use the word humans to mean finite minds which are capable of grasping the world and turning it into conceptual determinations? Yeah. I, okay. I think that's quite a new. Yeah. So and I use the word objective word because he is in Turkey's mm -hmm. talking about an objective world that is to be recognized. Um, and so, but yeah, if I understand it correctly, and if not, um, you can correct me, of course. And um, I would say, like, I mean, the question is big because somehow I use objective word and life as a synonym. Yeah, and, and that's why, of course, there is a question okay, um, what? What do I mean we mean by this? And I would say that also in the idea of life, it's about life, it's about the living spirit, and then about the whole um, living process and so on, and species. But in life, there's also like the other objective world and we're taking into account. And with that, I mean the mechanical structures, chemical structures, teleological structures. So I think the idea of life somehow entails um, the whole other parts of the objectivity part of course and um and the other part so uh, in, in logic so um so then for me it wouldn't be a surprise that we have a recognizing subject that tries to recognize the objective world because that would mean that it tries to recognize itself as, as this living in the world but also other objective structures because I take the idea of life not to be only about living with the subjects. I mean, that's the focus. But it's also about mechanical structures and about the relation of mechanical structures to proposal structures. Hmm. But I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, let me very briefly press you a little bit more. I do see Professor Holgate's waiting, so 30 seconds or less. Um, 
in the use of the word mind, it seems like you're invoking the kind of being where it is something that it is like to be that being, at least in a quite a weak sense. And even allowing quite a generous interpretation of life, such that life in the logic is at some level related to the kind of life we might find in nature, that covers the kind of life possessed by grasses, uh, mushrooms, uh, not necessarily the kinds of beings where there is something that it is like to be that being. So it seems like a new entity has entered the picture. Where has this new entity, a mind of that kind, come from? Well, actually, I think, okay, um, I, I, would, I, I don't think that that's a valid question. <laughs> Let's say it like this, I just refuse to answer it in a way because I feel like no, that's not the question Hegel himself like, weighs in a way. Because, but maybe it has to do with the way I understand the logic and what you understand it and things like this. So I don't know if he really, or like, yeah, I don't think that he's really trying somehow to reduce cognition out of life or whatever that means in a way. But um, I mean, of course, he wants to say that there's a conceptual development, and I think this claim is also okay. If there are finite cognizing subjects, then there must be life. I think that is true. So yeah, so we, we need life for yeah for this for having finite uh, cognizing subjects. But the other way around, I'm not sure if that's really a question he wants to answer. Thank you. Yeah. That's the last. Uh, Few, um, remarks. I mean, I um, I I just wanted to uh, um, in, invoke two uh, two papers that I think are supremely relevant to the, your theme, Philip, and have have made uh, the points like yours in a in a very lucid way. And the one is Michael Thompson's Naive Action Theory, which is a paper which shows that it's not helpful to seek to understand external purposiveness through the idea of intention, precisely because the idea of intention, insofar as it is to be an idea that is to be outside the sphere of the idea of the good, that is the idea of intention that is falls within the province of what nowadays is called action theory, that idea of intention must be understood through the idea of external purposiveness. So it's the other way around. This is it's, it's useless to uh, to to think. Oh, I understand what external purposiveness is because it's that what is there through intention. That's that's what the um, naive action theory paper shows. I think very. And the other is uh, Sarah Waterlow, uh, now Brody, but at that time when she wrote that paper, Waterlow, and it's called uh, Nature Craft and Phonesis and Erso, I think. Um, and there she um, makes extremely lucid remarks on the externality of the purposiveness um, or, or about the idea of an external purposiveness in distinction to um, the kind of purposiveness that constitutes both a craft and um, a living being. Uh, and it's precisely the externality. I mean, I think there's in this, in this discussion of the plow and so on, there's an adumbration I think of um, an internalization of the purposiveness. Because um, in fact, I mean, you said, and I, I don't think this was quite right. I mean, you said, okay, tilling, that's one thing. And then now the question is with what do I till? Shall I do it with my hands uh, or shall I do it with the plow? I think that's not really correct <laughs> because there wouldn't be any tilling where they're not a plow. Yeah, and and um, that's the case actually with, um, that's routinely the case in the conception of uh, tools that belong to a craft. They are themselves internal to the activity. And they, so, uh, so what, the reason why the plow is uh, more worthy than, the, uh, than what's achieved through it is, bec is because it's already, as were, a general realization of purpose. Yeah, it's, it belongs to a, a practice, a craft, and so on, so it points upwards. Yeah, um, I think it's in the, in the way in which you can, I think, learn from Aristotle. So I think uh, he, he'll 
is quite Aristotelian. So I, I, um, I think uh, this is um, one way to um, agree and um, as well corroborate or confirm your point that uh, thinking through that chapter must be thinking it through as a specification of objectivity. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and 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 um, that will be then in some way be contained as well within life and within the good. Actually, there's a reference back to that chapter in the good. So, but it's but it can't go the other way around. Yeah, so that 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 seems very good. I just want to point to the, the those two papers, which I think are just very good in uh, um, from. I mean, without concerning themselves with Hegel at all. Yeah, we're bringing this out, and uh, sorry, it's just uh, maybe. Uh, maybe maybe helpful. Yeah, that's really great. Thank you. I've not about Yeah, I was, I, I, if I can, I would like to make a remark about, about your um, your paper too. I mean, um, you said repeatedly that there needs to be life in order for there to be knowledge, and that can mean many things. And Hegel himself says quite precisely how it is to be understood within the, within the logic. Uh, he says it's a logical condition. And it's only in that respect that we're going to consider it. Yeah, uh, uh, so what does that mean? Um, I'm not sure. That it, uh, I mean, of course, I mean, uh, you know, I, I seek theoretical knowledge and I also live. Uh, I su suppose if, we're, if I weren't born, I wouldn't uh, seek theoretical knowledge. But I, I, I would think that the sense in which life is needed or as you put it for knowledge must be must come exclusively from the one quote that you gave namely that it is the truth of the genus process i mean the genus process is that in which the animal is universal and it's um as well a, a self-undermining form to realize that universality so, so so it's precisely so i i think the way in which life is necessary for knowledge is that through it we understand knowledge to as we're break free from the genus process <laughs> yeah that, that uh, so that, that would be my emphasis anyway so i'm i'm, I'm thinking you're importing some things that may have to, may have a play somewhere in the philosophy of spirit um that will be something i don't know much about <laughs> but uh the logic i i think this may be, i i have yeah, I, I find this passage, it, it was your second quote, I think, extremely intriguing, very difficult. Uh, and I would like to know how, how you understand it and how you understand that way in which life is a condition, insofar as that's expressed in that quote, the way in which it is a condition. Oh, yeah, okay. Then, yeah, I don't know if I can um, answer I think it was quote right. number two. It's about right that. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. No, no, no. Actually, quote one. No, 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 no. Where was it? Uh, it's where the G yeah. yeah right five. Thank you. Right, exactly. <laughs> Something like the yes. idea of a living species really breaks down for us. I'm thinking that's what's said there. Is, um, you know, the living species of an animal is um, a genus process. Yeah, and that, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So I want to know what you said. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I was, uh, yeah. I'm just puzzled by this thing. And it's really interesting. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering. Um, like, I, in a way, I would um, like to say that the what you said. So I was also wondering if your comment contradicts mine somehow, or if it's more so like something like a supplement, or that I should like elaborate, elaborate on this a little bit more in this way, because of course I don't want to say that, for example, that it's just an empirical argument or something that of course yeah. we have to talk nice and mm -hmm. want to talk nice and live, I think that's attributed. I mean, and I don't think that that's what he is doing. Um, and so where I'm coming from is sort of since I, yeah, I'm coming more from the actual background, the Kantian background, since I work a lot on the critique of power of judgment. And, um, and I mean, what Kant is somehow doing with his account of um, 
in a possessiveness. So we're like, okay, we can never really explain organisms. Somehow they are there, um, and we can describe them in terminological terms, but we can't explain them. They remain somehow mysterious to us. And I think, and like, come from this background, I think what he is doing is exactly the same way. It's not so mysterious because they are real ourselves and that are like the um, condition for cognizing for, for even having like structures, subjective structures. So yeah, I don't know if that's the end of that now. Yeah. yeah, so that's where I'm coming from and that's why I didn't thought so much, um, I must admit, about the exact transition. Also because I think that the transitions are really one of the most difficult ones. <laughs> like I, I always have a feeling to somehow understand what's going on in the life and the recognition, but the transitions are like really tricky. <laughs> So okay. I would have to, to think more about okay. this to, to yeah to say more precisely something about it. But I I I'm yeah actually I'm tempted to say that what you say said doesn't really contradict my own um, what I said, but it can maybe complement it mm -hmm. and I can like yeah elaborate on it more. I didn't I didn't think it contradicted it as yeah. I was not sufficiently clear about it as yes. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, there's an emphasis here on um, life as such being a logical condition of knowledge as such. I don't know that that translates immediately into a sort of the form, you know, I am alive. You know, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure of that. I, actually, I, I I know, and you seem to uh, think, you know, two things can be said of me. I think I live. Uh, now, the one thing is needed for the other. So it seemed to sound. Now I'm not quite sure whether this, how this stands anyway. Let me ask you this. I'm not sure how this line of thinking or what this form of consideration stands to the exposition of logical conditions of one, as were, logical concept um, residing in another. Um, I, I'm just... Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, I mean, I hope it was clear that I didn't want to make a period. No, no, that was clear. That was clear. It's just yeah. formally thinking, you know, yes. yeah. how I just, I'm just curious. I mean, how one would, you know, something like five, which I think I, it's, it's completely fair of you to say, I don't, I'm not really sure that I get this. I don't either. So that's, that's fair. But uh, five obviously is, I think, textually is the location where we are being shown that life is the logical condition of cognition. Uh, so the question should be, how does that which is said here relate to the form of consideration, not empirical, I grant you, the form of consideration you put forth, which has to do with myself as thinking and myself as living. I don't, I'm just I'm just writing this as a okay. as a question. I'm, I'm yeah. not sure that so, I mean I understand this quote or what I can say so far mm. would be okay and I we have somehow a self uh, relating structure like in the mm. organism everything is like means and ends mm. self mm. so there is some kind of self reflectivity yeah. you can say like this mm. and it is also this structure which. Um, that is relevant in the idea of cognition, but it's okay. more like the structure um, that when he says that mm. uh, the re idea relates to itself as idea, then I think he means something like um, in cognition, we um, get another stance on the structure because we can reflect the structure, it's that mm. what it is. Mm -hmm. And I would also say, um, I mean, Hegel is even using kind of the same vocabulary when it comes, for example, to the living process. And then the organism um, assimilates, and then to the um, process mm -hmm. of cognition, because it's all, also some kind of assimilated process, but a more reflective mm -hmm. one. You know. That's so far maybe what I want to say. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have time for any more questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Harris, thank you, Philip, and thank you, everyone who is uh, present. Uh, uh, one more round of applause. <laughs> You must know that this is the kind of conference where you need to raise your questions immediately, uh, <laughs> not knowing what you're going to ask, but <laughs> otherwise you won't. Yeah, you'd be warned. Uh.